Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mitch Weisberg, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get started with our EdChat interactive event today. Uh, today's discussion is going to be with Russ Qualia, who's uh, talking about school voice, and his guests will be Simon Feasy and Melissa Phillips Morse. Uh, he's going to introduce them in a few minutes. And today's session should be really, really interesting because Russ is always fantastic. Uh, so let me stop this and let me bring Russ up. Welcome back. Hey there, Mitch. So, uh, you know, I, we were talking earlier and you're just outside of Tampa. What brings you down to Florida? Um, I actually have an office down here and, and uh, live down here between the um, cold months in Maine. Well, I try to keep that a secret, but now I guess it's not that much of a oh, secret. So thank you. Uh, you know, somebody, uh, <laughs> leave it to me to, to blow a secret, right? <laughs> okay. And what's yeah. your address? Not that I'm going to tell anybody. But what? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That is awesome. Um, actually, so, it, it's awesome. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I, I can also just, um, now, now that I've blown one thing, do you want me to get off the stage and bring somebody up? <laughs> Why don't you get the hell off the stage and I'll, let's bring Simon up in like five minutes. Okay. I'll just give you well, a few, Oh, in five minutes. Okay. All right. I'll go ahead. Yeah. All right. Perfect. And again, th I want to thank Mitch and Shindig for um, for this. It's just a great. It's a great platform. And albeit as this is no secret, I'm not a lover of doing these things. I actually do enjoy doing Shindig um, because they make it so easy to do. As Mitch has shared, I am in my Florida office. Interestingly, the first time I've actually done one of these from a place that either hasn't been in a foreign country, a different time zone than the Eastern time zone, or a hotel room. So this is my office. I'm sure you're pretty impressed with those books because I positioned that just so you could see those books. But if you look really closely, you will see none of them are education books. They're all cookbooks. Um, but you don't know that because of TV. The um, Although the school year is coming to a close and things are winding down a bit, we're certainly not um, at Quiza and the stuff that's going on. I want to give a few updates, and then I just want to jump right into this um, of some updates since the last time I, I was on with you, and I don't even remember where I was actually the last time I was on with you, but um, since then, we've got now engagements in Hong Kong and Australia, which is kind of fun for us, I think. Um, Mickey and I are going to be heading off to Dubai in August because we understand that is like the best time to go to Dubai um, because the weather is so pleasant and nice. The, um, we have a few new books coming out over the course of the next few months, actually. One book that's coming out, matter of fact, I just sent the final proof in this morning, uh, Principal Voice, Listen, Learn, and Lead, an offshoot of the student voice work that Mickey and I wrote. The more research we were doing around student and teacher voice, I realized and was told by principals that they didn't have a voice. So Corwin asked me to write a small book. It's relatively short um, around the importance of principal voice. It's part of a, a series that they're doing. In the first three books, uh, Michael's doing one, Michael Fulham's doing one, um, Change Process. And the third book is by Young Zhao. Some of you might know his book um, around world class leaders. So I'm mean, certainly incredibly fine company with the first set of books going out, and those will be out within the next month. Right after that, um, a book that Lisa Landy and I have completed. Um, we haven't seen the final proofs yet, but that book is completed and in press is Teacher Voice, Amplifying Success. And last but not least, um, a book I've done with Mickey again, uh, Chris Fox and Gavin Dykes about Aspire High, kind of our vision for a school of the future. And um, that, is a, that is a meaty book and, and well thought out and kind of a book that's been in the making for, I don't know, a good 10, 15 years, I think. Um, most recently, we just are working on another new one called Parent Voice. You've heard me talk about Parent Voice. I'm not sure what I think about Parent Voice, but we can all stay tuned to see what I write about that, um, doing that with Chris Fox. So those are pretty cool things going on. Excited about that. Um, another thing that has happened, which you, you will hear at the end of this broadcast, is that we have recorded a new song called Voice Our Aspirations. Um, Dr. Mickey Corso is the lead vocal. It's quite a, no, he's not. Um, he wanted to be, but I just wouldn't let him. The, um, 
it's done by one of our colleagues, uh, Wade Caldwell Sonneville, who's just an amazing, amazingly talented individual. He's done work with us in LA, um, does lots of things on cultural awareness, and um, wrote the song together, produced the music, went to New York City, uh, and put it all together, which was which was fun. So you'll actually get the first airing of the show. You won't see the video that goes with it yet because that's still in production. Um, but now we have become recording artists, so that's that's kind of fun. So we got a pack full day. Um, the team is signed in, or at least I've seen some of them. I see Mickey, I see Chris. I believe they're both in Oklahoma City, or at least that's where they tell me they are. Um, I can see Lisa Landy. She, I believe, is in Idaho. She's got that Idaho look on her face. Um, and I see Sue Harper. I don't know if this other's out there. I can't see through all this stuff, but Sue Harper, who is in Maine. So we're a little bit of everywhere, just like typical. But Mickey, um, when I get done talking with Simon and Missy, I'll kick it over to Mick. He'll give a few updates, introduce Lisa, then introduce Chris with some updates on that, do some Q&A, and we'll do a little bit of a wrap-up at the end. So. Um, I need to stop yapping to get us into things. So let me first bring up, Mitch, could we bring up Simon, please? Mickey went there, I think, a couple months ago, not, not that long ago, and um, came back with these amazing reviews. And Mickey's exact words to me were, Simon is exactly how you thought he would be. Um, because I thought Simon would be like this guy walking on water being this inspiration, passionate, bright guy leading his staff. And Mickey said, you're exactly that, Simon. So one, thank you for taking this work to another whole level in your school. And thank you for agreeing to do this today because I think, what time is it? Is it 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock? About 10 past 8. <clears throat> well, thank you for coming. So Simon, let me, let me kick this right over to you and ask you, um, what is your vision for the school? What have you been up to? And, and why the aspiration student voice work? How does this play out for you? Because the people in the audience, they want to hear what's working in schools and why schools are doing this work. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm embarrassed and flattered by Mickey's comments. He's very kind. Uh, I think we. The student voice side is extremely important to us, but interestingly, you, you call your work school voice. And I think that certainly applies to the vision that we have for school. It's very much across school, it's across school community. Uh, we're working heavily with the pupil side, but I think our vision is democracy and how far we can go with that. And if I go back to a conversation that I've had with Sarah Martin, who's principal of Stonefield School in New Zealand. We, we have regular Skypes and a very early conversation, we were talking about what it is to have a democratic learning organization. And it was Sarah herself who actually mentioned your work. So from that point, I made contact and it's sort of grown in terms of our engagement with the Kuali Institute, with your work, from reading of materials to what we're actually doing actively in school now. But it, it, in, in, in answer to your question about vision, I think it's in alignment with all of the work we're doing around engendering relational trust, relational power in school. And if, you are, if you're saying that you're going to have an ear to student voice, to teacher voice, to community voice. You have to have a vehicle to actually do that. Previously, we had mocked up sort of questionnaires that were based around, are you happy at school? Do you feel safe at school? Does your child, do you feel that your child gets a good educational experience at Barda Primary School? But it wasn't in the depth that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it wasn't in the depth that the aspirations profile that all of this hangs on um, offers. So first off, we, we bought into the questionnaires and actually distributed them online with all the key stage two. We put it out to parents. We had 110 respondents across a single weekend from parents. 
we have a parent teacher strategy group where we're looking at this idea of spanning boundaries homeschool so in the interests of building trust and transparency the outcomes of the questionnaires we laid on the table we laid all of that there and we had the kind of conversations that um, we would want to have I mean I, I was only talking to Sarah last night Skype wise Stonefield and she said that they're what they're working on at the minute is having the community or certainly the staff feel comfortable when they are uncomfortable mm. now if you're putting out a set of questions in this way you've got to be prepared for what comes back some of it makes you feel uncomfortable but if you're doing that with the parents with the children and going through that process then there's your trust there's your relational power and you can keep building on that what I particularly like about your work Ross and Mickey's work is that you take that voice and then you throw responsibility back mm. now I've heard you say that so you're asking this parents you're asking for this community you're asking for this students let's create a shared vision and let's go with that I think that's round and about the point we're at um, what really gave it rocket fuel was Mickey's visit now Mickey came into school and he worked with us now you can read all this stuff all you like you know, you can interpret questionnaires and work through the lens the perspective that you hold but Mickey came in with the all too apparent passion that he had with decades of work around school voice and what it could do the power it could lend to your organization come the end of that day I had staff members coming to me and saying that was the best learning day we have had ever now just to um, just to add to that Mickey said <clears throat> there were a group of children on the field because it was a professional learning day but we had an outdoor provider doing sports on the field he said to me can I have some of them after break and I said what for he said let's do a live focus group session in a fishbowl with all the staff there and these children came in and I have to say with four or five of their parents too and we all sat there together while Mickey conducted this this open forum conversation and it was just sensational now that sort of transparent working that sort of honesty I think is what all of this can drive so our vision is democracy and how far you can go that with that as a community does that make sense yeah it, it, it not only it not only makes sense um, it just reinforces everything I said about you and everything that Mickey said about you and here's the interesting thing Simon just so that you know Mickey's not even the best one on our staff uh, we have way better people than Mickey so, so, so. <laughs> I'm not believing that Mickey I know you're there <clears throat> no Mickey, so, so, Mickey is um, we're doing, doing a lot of work around, around sorry we're doing a lot of work around visible learning John Hattie's work and I know Sarah's in the do you call it an audience on shindig I don't know yeah. Sarah's there from Midlothian educational psychologist she's um, principal psychologist there and I know she yeah. would she would say along with me that the the pupil voice student voice community voice just sits wonderfully with John Hattie's work around visible learning so working those two together has has shifted us as a learning organization massively and i look forward to to what will come in the future no i i, I think that one of the interesting things simon um, that we talked to early before we got on with everyone else is that connectedness between the visible learning work john's work and our, our work um, as a matter of fact he's on the cover of the next book 
the, the teacher voice book um, because he believes obviously in the student teacher voice piece and when he does that meta analysis piece we, we kind of get more at the ground level there about how to operationalize those pieces pieces and together it forms a pretty strong union and I, I love John's work and um, it's been a it's been a great match for all of us um, so having a school like yours, like like yours. Operationalize it, and it, um, along with Sarah Martins too I mean I, I love that I didn't even know you knew her uh, although it all came back to when you said that's how we got connected but Sarah's a gift down in New Zealand I just I just think it's great and I think what you represent um, is the notion of this can happen everywhere we can learn from places whether it's Beta Primary or in a minute Cobb County or Dubai, Hong Kong, New Zealand. I think that's the beauty of the work because this aspirations voice stuff quite frankly it's a common voice. It's a common voice that we all need to take responsibility. I was at ASCD last week did a symposium um, myself in the, um, in the Chancellor of Education and we talked about this notion of it's not just us, the leaders out there promoting voice, it's the students taking responsibility for their voice. It's you call they're on the citizenship piece. We can do all we want, but until teachers and students take that responsibility of this is my school, I need to own this, um, we're always gonna have these conversations. I'm gonna come right back to it with, with Mickey in a minute, but let me bring up and thank you, sounds brilliant. Okay. Let me bring up, let me bring up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. Missy is at Cobb County. That's right. She is the Director of Instruction and Innovation, which I think is just cool to begin with. Like, you cannot <laughs> be in that district unless you go through Missy's uh, permission process. Um, <laughs> but, but Missy brought us on uh, earlier on talking specifically around teacher voice, um, and I, I did the, the keynote. I guess opening a school last year, mm -hmm. um, it was kind of fun. They didn't kick me out. Well, they sort of kicked <laughs> me out, but I came back anyway. Um, and we're just rolling into that work. We've got a demonstration site that's starting up this year at Daniels Middle School, which will be a lot of fun, working with the Teacher Leadership Academy and the leadership seminars. And um, so, Missy, welcome. And what I would love you to talk about is the notion of the systemic changes around voice and aspirations and your vision for the district because what you represent for me is we have these pockets going on with schools and so on and i think that's brilliant i think that's great your challenge being in charge of a district of it's like 120 schools right 114 114 schools um 11 12 000 teachers you're looking at this from a systems approach and i think that's a, a challenge obviously and it challenges us at, at the Institute. So could you talk a little about your vision as, as you see this work growing? Sure, and thank you for having me today. This is really a lot of fun. Um, we feel really strongly that the power to transform education is in the hands of our teachers and our students. And so the intersection of student voice and teacher voice was really powerful to us. We really started with the idea of student voice with our Kid Talk competition and the idea that we were going to have a student keynote. Russ, Russ had to follow um, three of the coolest kids um, sharing their thoughts for all of our 8,000 teachers of why not uh, was the theme last year. And so we felt like we had to bring this large district back around to the idea of what's about students. And uh, it's real easy in a bureaucracy this size to be able to lose the students in those conversations. Uh, as we talked, it became clear that the real vehicle is actually through the teachers, that if we're going to have students who can find their voice and be empowered, that we have to empower teachers as well. And so last year was our inaugural year of our Teacher Leader Institute. Um, we felt like we needed to not try to do everything through the classroom, the, the building administrators, but instead real change was going to come by empowering teachers. And so we had 125 teachers last year, K-12, who went with us through a series of leadership trainings that were not about leaving the classroom and I think that's really important. We wanted these teachers to be leaders from where they were in the chairs they were in because the power of that level of grassroots change is really huge in a building and of course we support principals at 114 schools and they have figured out pretty quickly that by also 
utilizing these teacher leaders who have been empowered to find their voice and seek solutions, that it makes their lives a whole lot easier. And that if you have a building full of teachers who understand their voice and are empowered to use their voice for real educational transformation, where that school can go uh, is unlimited. And it really then gives that opportunity for students to find and attach to and, and really grow and be engaged in what they're doing. So we feel like it's going to have this domino effect of as more teachers are sort of indoctrinated into the way that we really feel like they need to be empowered as leaders, um, they're going to turn that over to their students as well. And I, and I think it's through that we're going to see major change in our district. Well, and I, I beautifully said, Missy, and I think one of, some of the questions we have when people sign up, they have questions for us. And one of the questions we get asked all the time is, you know, how do you take this to the system level? And I think you're modeling it perfectly, where you've got a core group of teacher leaders. 125 sounds like a crazy amount, except they were so <laughs> engaging when Lisa and I were there. They were so engaging. It wasn't like you were hurting anything. They were just, they were on point. Um, and wanted more. So that mm -hmm. I think that is great. But I, the other key piece I think that you're doing in a district that size, similar to what we're trying to do in LA, is create those teacher leadership forums, work with the leadership team, even the principals and administrators, but also to have a pilot school in that district where people can point to and say, listen, we're talking about it, we talk about it in groups, we're studying it, we're reading about it. Here's a school that's going to build the capacity, the internal capacity, so you guys can take it to scale, not us. Right. Just build the internal capacity to take the scale. And I, I just think, I just don't see that in districts, so I, which is why you're the director of innovation. <laughs> Yeah, we're really excited about that. Unfortunately, the principal who of that school, Daniel Middle School, wanted to join us today, but he's in Disney World, so he's actually down there not too far from you with band kids uh, at the end of the year. But yeah, we we found a leader, similar to Simon, uh, who really gets it, right? So David Nelson is the principal of that school. He had already um, made huge leaps and bounds at improving the culture of his school. Students really have a really strong voice. I was in his office the other day and he had strategic plans up on one side of his wall and then student feedback on the strategic plan next to it. Never seen that before in a building. Uh, validated the decision that we made that Daniel's the right place to do this demonstration school. So yeah, the exciting part is this idea of we build this internal capacity so that you can scale it to 114 schools. And one of the things I failed to mention is that the teachers who graduate in a couple of weeks from our Leader Academy this year will become the mentors mentors to the teachers who are in it for the following year. So we're talking about 300 or so teachers who are then going to keep the message going and really start s spreading it around in the district. So um, add the Daniel staff of about 60 and um, doesn't seem like a lot when you're talking about 8,000 teachers, but it starts to have an impact. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, you know what? I, I know Chris is on this call, Chris Fox, and her research is around um, this whole notion of adult learners and what you've done is kind of operationalize what she talks about the importance where it's not a year of PD next year it's something different but it's building off last year's PD have them become the leaders for the next generation of PD so this just becomes embedded and it's going to take a few years but it becomes a part of who you are as an organization Right, and you know, we really fight this idea of the one year, one theme, one year, one theme, one year, one theme. And so while, you know, Russ joined us last year as um, our kickoff for our teachers, he's coming back this year. We really did enjoy him. So he's coming back this year and bringing Lisa Landy with him to bridge. Last year's talk was all about student voice. This year is all about student transition, student voice transitioning to teacher voice. And so, you know, you, we're going to have 8,000 teachers who say, thank God we understand where we're we're headed. We're not changing gears. We're not changing paths. We're keeping on the same path. And I think that's really critical in education and particularly in a district this size where it's real easy to jump on a bandwagon and go off on a tangent. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think I heard you say that, although it might not have been your exact words, but I thought I heard you say I was better than Mickey. I just, I, I thought I heard that. Uh, well, I haven't had that pleasure of seeing Mickey or hearing Mickey yet, so I have to reserve judgment on that. But, I mean, Lisa seems to be a lot more popular in Cobb uh, if you rank the teachers. So, I don't know, maybe maybe I the best is yet to come. I, I guess. Geez, I don't even know why I'm doing what I'm doing anymore. <laughs> oh, no. 
I think that's great. And you know what? I'll tell you, it made me think of this just hearing you talk about Daniel's uh, middle school and Simon's school at Bader is we just got to make that connection because it's one of the things that got David very excited is about these international connectedness. Um, I'm going to flip this over to Mickey. Before I flip this over to Mickey, I would love to ask you the question, and then I want to bring Simon and ask him the same question, and then I'll turn this over to Mick um, before, I, like in two minutes. But Missy, can you talk about, because this is always another issue, and it's, you know, it's not just all hunky-dory. What has been some of the barriers to this kind of work that you've seen so far? And again, we've just started there, uh, starting the service, but are there barriers that you have to deal with? Yeah, I think the biggest barrier is fear. So there's a fear that's involved in saying that we want to hear what students and teachers have to say. And, um, you know, I think leaders are particularly fearful when they hear the idea of teacher voice, they think teacher complainer, right? And so I think there's fear involved when they don't understand that it's really about teacher empowerment and teacher responsibility. Ultimately, um, I think that it can be scary. So I would say fear at the unknown of what does it mean? And, and kind of like what Simon was saying, you get survey results back that point to areas you need to improve. Maybe things aren't uh, as great as you're wanting to believe they are. So I, th I think that fear factor is important. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Stay, actually, we'll come back to with some questions. Uh, Mitch, can you bring Simon back up for a second before I turn this to Mick? Hey, hey Simon. Simon. Same question. It's just, it just, I love Cindy. Um, and I love how Mitch is organizing, so thank you, Mitch. Um, Simon, let me ask you that same question again before I flip this over to Mick. But what have been some of your barriers? And I know you profoundly believe in this, and you've had obviously the work with Visible Learning and John, and, and just you, quite frankly, of, of taking this to another level. What have been some of your barriers with this work? Because I'm sure there's been some. Mm -hmm. There are no barriers. There are, there are no barriers unless you erect them Indeed. and you begin with the leader, you begin with the head, the, the principal. I could, I could look for and identify barriers, yeah. but you've got to ride on through them. Now that's all part of getting to be comfortable when you're uncomfortable. Mm. I mean, we have many difficult conversations day on day. That's part of our role as leaders in schools. Right. But you've got to grasp that and move on from that. Yeah. So in terms of barriers, I say there are no barriers. Interesting. And you've got to look at it from that point of view. Uh, and you take the opportunities and you move things forward. Now, I'm not saying you, that you do that without a thought to others. Right. But I'll give you one example. Um, we had an issue, let's call it an issue, with staff only a fortnight ago. And we were talking about some were going with the idea of streaming, some mixed ability classes, setting, and different people were saying different things. And I'd have one person come to me and say, that won't work because, or that won't work because. What it did was I said, we'll talk about it tonight. And I went in the largest room in the building, I got a whole load of uh, tables and made one big circle. And we sat down, we thrashed it out, and I said, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think? And do you know what? We were about that far away from one another in the end. It's the lens you take to it. So once it was all out there and shared, what we did, I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with Judith Glazer's work about conversational intelligence, but we'd taken it to what she'd called a third level. Everybody had shared, and we'd co-created an answer <clears throat> for ourselves. The barriers will be there if you see them. Just don't look at them and move on through. And, 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 and when you do see a potential barrier, you, you deal with it in, in an open and honest way, as you just did, obviously. Um, yeah. I'll, one more question, because it just came up on the screen, and I, I will ask Missy this next year, although because she just started. But because of the work that you've done with pupil voice, what kind of changes have you seen in the school? I think pupil voice wise, and I'm trying to think of a specific example. Okay, let's look at celebration of work. Mm -hmm. 
does my teacher celebrate work? We had a very low score on that. So a lot of children, the vast majority of people were saying that we do not celebrate their work as teachers. Okay, so that led to a conversation. Now, because of our visible learning bend, most of the learning environment in the classroom is stuff that supports learning. And it can be messy. It can actually be messy, and the interaction can make that messy. What they were doing was looking up and thinking, there's not, none of my work up there. But actually, because we blog work, there was the celebration through that so we had that conversation around that but the conversation also led to well what about all the spare space what about the space in the corridors yes of course we must and indeed when artworks done like the Kadinsky stuff that was done by year three the other day on huge big boards they varnished them and we put them up by the front entrance Beautiful. so visibly you can see it now and they were telling us that. How did we that thought we were doing them a favour. How did that affect behaviour? Affects behaviour of children. Yeah. They feel valued. You know, as, the, as that builds, the sense of belonging becomes all that much greater. I think the sense of belonging in our staff now is tangible awesome. because of what we put into professional learning. And that work around visible learning, school boy. Now we have to make sure that the children feel they're in the same place. Yeah. Right, that, I say that is beautiful. I got to tell you, and I, I say this with all sincerity. John Hattie must be incredibly proud of the work you're doing. I am certainly proud of the work you're doing. Um, we're going to bring you back up here in a minute with Mickey, but you have my word. I am going to come there and visit that school because I want to learn. Um, I'll just t just tell you, staff, well, like Mickey's helper. Just tell them I'm Mickey's helper. So, Mitch, okay. could you bring up Mickey, please? Although I'm afraid to deal with him right now. Hello there, Dr. Corso. Hello, Dr. Qualia. How are you? Wow. Wow. I, I didn't know this job shift happened so quickly. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> I know, yeah. Um, um, I'm just trying to dodge the tornadoes here in uh, in uh, Oklahoma City, both literally and figuratively. Uh, by the way, um, yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for Simon's words. We we had a great day there that day that I was there. Obviously, he had done a lot of shovel work to prepare the ground uh, and continues to water what we planted. Um, really grateful for his kind words and always grateful to a big brother to keep me back uh, grounded on earth so uh, uh, so it's all good I thought I before I jump in Russ with um, up you know some field updates I thought we'd take advantage again as we do it usually around this time of the Jindig platform and get people you know interacting with one another for a few minutes around um, I have two questions but you know when you choose a partner somebody you see here who you don't know uh, who you can connect to um, as Mitch shared, just by clicking, you know, clicking your avatars together, um, maybe there's two questions that they, both speakers have sort of to us. It comes from Simon. You know, what what are the tensions between getting to a democratic learning organization? You know, all the voice work that they're doing, student voice, uh, staff voice, parent voice, and the traditional hierarchical structure of schools. You know, there's there's got to be some. Uh, tensions between the way we've always done it uh, and moving towards a more democratic process and then what are some practical steps forward given that tension so maybe that'd be one question uh, people can discuss and I've, I'm trying to pop these into the window here um, uh, so hopefully you'll be able to see it the second question coming from Missy's uh, comments is what risks are there when you empower teachers um, she talked about fear right um, and that's that's a big risk and some, something you need courage to face down but what are some of the other risks and how can you get um, to, to put the two speakers together? How can you get comfortable with being uncomfortable when you empower teachers? I got all these teachers running around feeling empowered, you know. Um, how, do you get, how do you get comfortable with that? Um, and what do you do about that? So choose one of those two questions or one of your own um, invention and talk to someone else in this room. And uh, I have 2.38 on my clock. And we'll just do that for about maybe four minutes. Give each person a couple minutes. Connect up. Uh, so hi again, everybody. Maybe if you can hear me pop out of your uh, groups, 
I trust that in four minutes you were able to solve it all. Uh, um, I think for the sake of time, if you had something at this point you wanted to share off of your conversation with your uh, colleague or this new person that you've uh, discussed these two questions which, with into the um, question box here, you know, pop it into the, the shindig IM message, some, some of the tensions that you discussed and maybe some practical steps forward and um, what came of that. So if you could type those in. Um, that would be great. And as those comes in, as those come in, uh, and I and I share updates as people are doing that, we can um, maybe then bring someone else uh, from the audience up on stage to actually uh, explain a little further what they wrote there. Um, some updates from uh, the field end of things. Uh, Chris Fox and I uh, recently presented at the ASCD conference uh, on our work, um, basically walking a group of people through our model through student voice, uh, through the systemic approach that we take, looking at some of the national data um, that we're accumulating for the 16-17 school year. Hot on the trail of the next national report. We have not written a national report uh, in about a year and a half. So um, we're excited by this uh, new report. It's going to contain all the voice data we've collected. No normally, we publish separate reports, uh, you know, a separate student report, a separate uh, teacher report. Um, but we've decided to take the approach in this report, and maybe uh, most likely from here forward, of combining um, into a single report. Uh, you're picking up maybe on a comment Simon made that our work is now goes under the banner of school voice, um, not just separately student or teacher voice. Um, and so what is the dialogue? What is the conversation that the data we've collected over the last year and a half, what kind of conversation is there going on nationally for us around um, our framework, around the ideas of, of, of student voice and student efficacy? How does it exactly impact uh, students' academic uh, motivation, um, teacher, uh, uh, teacher's ability to hang on in a profession that's getting tough with the various budget cuts and, and uh, standards. Um, we're, we're also discussing uh, the, the conversation that's happening in some circles anyway, not everywhere yet, between the new uh, Every Student Succeeds Act, the ESSA, the reauthorization of uh, No Child Left Behind, and this opening that the law creates to measure uh, school climate and culture, uh, issues around students' self-worth, engagement, purpose, uh, teacher engagement. Um, so this is for the first time in our, in, at least in the United States, in our federal um, law, the uh, expectation that school success can be measured in other ways besides on reading and math scores. So uh, we're excited about that and we, we talk a lot about that at the Institute. Look for a series of blogs from the, uh, the Quality Institute team in June put out by Corwin where that's a part of what we're going to be blogging about. Um, the the sort of intersection of our work and um, and the new law, uh, and you never know those laws how 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 they trickle down to, to um, the ground. You know, certainly I haven't talked to any students recently that are talking about the new ESSA law and how it, what a boon it's going to be for education. Um, but um, ultimately, it's it's going to uh, um, influence at least some of what we do in schools. Uh, Dr. Brian Connell and I were in, in California last week at Woodside High School. They continue to amaze. If you're um, looking at our Twitter feed, you saw this whole art, art project based on the eight conditions, which just blew me away. Um, uh, Diane, the principal there, uh, had created this amazing uh, teacher uh, evaluation system based on I know my class as one option for doing teacher. I'm very impressed with that. Look for that getting tweeted out and put on our Facebook page too. We want to share that. Um, and then the last thing is that we're, we're a finalist. I don't, people don't know about maybe this XQ Super School grant where <laughs> um, they're asking people to uh, reinvent the American high school. And since we had already done that in Aspire High uh, before the grant was announced, we thought we'd just take the book and, you know, reconfigure the genre into a grant proposal. And we've gone through two, we've been passed on for two rounds now and are in sort of the uh, semifinals, I guess you would say. We're really excited about that. It's forcing us to really think very concretely about um, what we think the best the best way to approach um, the education of our uh, adolescents and I think really all students is. So look for that. Uh, either if we get the grant, they're going to announce it in August, or certainly when the book comes out um, uh, in the near future. So those are my updates, Russ. Uh, if you want to 
jump back up here with me. Um, great, great. Thanks, Nick. Um, do you want to see if anybody wants to share some of the things they've talked about? Yeah, let me catch up. It looks like Mark Anderson jumped off. And Maybe just Mark's got his answer there about visioning and, and the critical importance of central office, which we're feeling uh, sharply uh, today. Uh, I won't get into it. It's a public information uh, if you want to um, look up the district I'm in today. But uh, uh, yes, yeah, central office support is kind of critical uh, to all of this. Um, you know, Simon's already brought up the point, uh, as has Missy, about the importance of, of certain the principle to this process, um, and obviously their governing structures are a little different in the UK than ours here. But you know, in a lot of ways, principles are all answerable to their uh, central office, to the superintendent. So, in in a lot of districts in this country, you also need that um, leadership uh, to be part of the equation. So, Mark, can we get Mark up here? Mark, if you raise your hand, it makes it easier for Mitch to find you in the um, in the C. Um, I think I found Mark, but uh, he had left his computer. Mark Anderson. As right? a bot, take. Yes, it's a it's a robot. Ah, but um, you know maybe maybe Melissa. Yeah, well, that was a good answer from some bot. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Maybe maybe bring Melissa back up. Let's actually let's. Uh, Mitch, I'm a little concerned about the time. Yeah. I think I think let's bring Lisa Landy up. Okay. Um, all right, to continue so Lisa, the updates, right and we'll see if Mark comes back in the meantime. Okay. So can you bring up Lisa? Lisa, if you raise your hand, I think. Yeah. I know she's down there somewhere. Hey. <laughs> there you are. Hey, Lisa. Yeah. How's your hey, hand? Thanks. Well, you know, it's it's still attached. Um, yeah, I have learned a hard lesson that I am That's probably good. no longer talker with my children. So, um, <laughs> um, but anyway, it's yes. been it's been great. <laughs> that is a hard and, lesson. Uh, yeah, um, I have to say it was. It's just so. I'm sure you probably felt the same listening to Simon talk about your visit and your work. But it's just so exciting to sit back and listen to Missy talk about the work in Cobb County, and it's. It's really such a privilege. It really is. Um, and I hope everybody knows, I think we all authentically feel that way, that it's such a privilege to partner with your efforts and districts and the hard work that leaders are engaged in um, every day around bringing this concept of voice to scale for students and for teachers. And um, so Missy, great job. I loved hearing you tell your story. And I'm so looking forward to being with you in, in just a few weeks. And thanks for all you're doing. Mm. Um, so it's Teacher Appreciation Month, and we're all super excited about that. Um, uh, Mickey spoke about a series of blogs that were that our team's working on, and Russ and I just posted one last week. I'll pop it into the chat feature um, here in just a minute before we're done if anybody's interested in checking it out. But um, I bring it up because I learned some really interesting things from the way Russ's brain thinks um, in writing an intro to this blog post, and I learned that um, what is it? I, I think you wrote that October's National Squirrel Awareness Month. Did not know that. Um, January is National Oatmeal Month. Certainly did not know that. Um, so I guess considering all the celebrating we do of inanimate objects, we should be really happy that we have a month or a week that's dedicated to celebrating teachers. But our thinking has kind of been around, that's great, and yes, let's celebrate teachers up all all month long. But do we do that on a consistent basis? Do we really celebrate teachers on a year-round basis and and not in a way of just putting an apple in the box or sending a thank you note to a teacher that has changed your life which we think are great things and we should all do that but do we really celebrate and honor teachers by valuing their voice as professionals and by giving them opportunities to be a part of meaningful decision making and um, I just I love the connection between what Missy was talking about and what Simon was talking about in envisioning that democratic organization for a staff to be truly comfortable in the uncomfortable, and then what it takes to go from a place of fear to really living out that democratic organization um, with a group of, of professionals. And the way we all interact and engage from teachers to um, community to parents to students, every stakeholder group, the way that we interact with each other has great impact 
on the value that teachers have and feel um, as a professional in their role. So anyway, we're spending our, a lot of our time in, in this month and beyond this month having conversations about how do we really take that into action and, and make it so, make it part of you know the ethos of a system where teacher voice and student voice are both just the, a way of being, the way that we the way that we behave on a consistent basis and having actions that really show value for the voices of, of those closest to the organization, the teachers and the students. That was kind of a lot, but we got really, we've been really excited about um, moving in in this direction. We'll be doing more work at the end of the month um, with an amazing group of teachers in LA Unified. Uh, the whole team, I think, has been there at some point over the course of the year, and that's been a really engaging project to be in. Great things happening there. And then really looking forward to being with Missy's team in Cobb County the first week of June and kicking that off with, with a new group of, of teacher leaders in Georgia. Great. Thanks, Mitch. Um, obviously, the tornado did find Mickey. And uh, <laughs> so I'm not sure what happened, but if he comes back, we can pop him right back up again. Um, Lisa, thanks for, the, for those updates. Um, I, I agree. The, the teacher voice work is is in a bit of a boom right now, which is which is incredible. Um, it speaks volumes to the work that work that you've been doing. Um, and in that actually that that blog we wrote, I guess a few weeks ago, but got posted last week. Um, it was fun to do, and I learned a lot about special days. And you know, in some ways, I think it's good we have a week of teacher appreciation. In other ways, I think it's sad we don't have more. Um, but again, thanks for those updates, and I do hope that hand gets better. All right, so Mitch, let, I will let me give a quick update on what's going on with there. I think, um, or I can make stuff up about what's going on there. But what what Chris has been working on is the age three to grade three research project with NAESP. And again, I'm thinking of Simon. What you talked about earlier, because I know you've got um, three year olds, is the work we're doing about trying to understand what they mean by voice and aspirations and what matters to them and so on. And so the executive summary will be released in July, um, the first week of July. I'm actually doing the keynote at the conference and we'll release it then. And um, it's been good work. I mean, we've learned a lot. I mean, some really shocking things, quite frankly, um, about the kids' perception of voice and leadership to their um, kind of an inside little cue here. Their perception of leadership is someone that does what they're told and are quiet, which is pretty much the opposite of my perspective of what a leader is. Um, my perspective is someone that does what not what they're not told and is certainly not quiet. But again, we just started learning from them, and I and I think it's exciting. Um, what I want to do, can I bring up? We only have just a few minutes left, literally two minutes left. I want to bring up Simon and Missy one more time and see if they have any closing thoughts. We'll bring up either one would be great. Hey, Missy, Not. you got pressure on you. I need a 30-second final shot. You're like on CNN now. <laughs> Uh, no, what I would say is I would love to partner with anybody who's on here to talk about how we make this community broader and wider and ideas of things that are working where you are that you bring to the table that we could bring to our work. But we encourage anybody who is interested in partnering with us to talk about what this work looks and feels like. Awesome. Thank you, Missy. You're welcome. Uh, and can I bring Simon up, please? <laughs> Hey there, Simon. Hello. A big thank you, really, to you for your work, to Mickey for his work. It's great to be involved with it, and you know, more power to your elbow, and more of this. You know, I find that I'm I'm working more now with educationalists in the U.S., in Canada, in New Zealand, in Australia than I am locally in our region. Now that's great, it's fantastic. Perhaps you should do a bit more regionally, but the, the worldwide stuff, we've got so much to learn from each other. We might have different, um, different ways of working system-wise, but at the end of the day, when you're talking about school voice, it's the same wherever you are, isn't it? Yeah. Let's keep learning. Perfectly said. Thank you, Simon and, and Missy for joining us today. 
I can't believe that hour went by so quickly, actually. Um, mm. Just so appreciative. There will be more of this. This, interestingly, is going to be the last one we're doing this year. Um, we'll start up again next September. But in the meantime, you'll be seeing lots of new stuff on, on the website and, and new publications that we've got coming out. But a heartfelt thanks um, to you uh, and to Missy for all you're doing in, in the field and certainly to, to Mickey um, and continually carrying the torch and to Chris um, and Lisa um, for their work in the field and leading the, the initiatives um, in their own in their own rights. So I will sign off. Mitch, is it possible? I don't know if you have it. Could, put, could we end this with the Aspirations song? Do you have it? So, so um, no, I, I, uh, I understand that it was just emailed to me, but I, I need to be able to load it ahead of time. So, ah. um, so unfortunately, I mean, I'll sing whatever you want. I twinkle, twinkle, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, well, in that case, I'll tell you what. It just makes the suspense that much more exciting. In September, right? Yeah, in, in September. We're going to actually release it, I think, at NASP conference um, in, in just a month or so. But we'll put it online. We'll make sure we have everybody's email. I promise we're going to send it to you. Uh, we'll make sure we do. That was my kind of mess up. I, oh, just yes, thought, I think Mickey is volunteering to sing it. Oh, man. Well, we ran out of time, or we probably would have oh, to do that's, that. That's the way it goes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, you know something? Any, anybody who goes to the Mets game this weekend, I think Mickey's going to be singing it there, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Instead of the anyway, National Anthem. Listen, thanks to our friends on there. I see Gavin on there. Thanks, Gavin. Awesome to see you. Uh, I see Bob Sampson just got a new job in, 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 um, in Rockport. That's very exciting. Awesome people on there today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I know this sounds crazy, but I'll see you in September, and that'll be here before you know it. Okay. Guys. Have a great summer, everybody. Okay. Take care. Bye.